Hi, I'm Chris Potts. This video is the second in a two-part companion to my 2015 paper with Percy Leong called Bringing Machine Learning and Compositional Semantics Together. The previous lecture discussed the core linguistic and machine learning concepts relevant for what is generally called semantic parsing. This lecture presents a basic framework for defining and pursuing research questions in this area of NLP. Implementations of the models and examples are available here in case you want to begin hacking in this area yourself. I should say that in the interest of time, the lecture leaves out a lot of the challenges of representation and optimization that come with semantic parsing on real data sets. Percy's 2013 computational linguistics paper with Michael Jordan and Dan Klein is a good follow-up resource for those topics. Let's begin with the semantic parsing task. In terms of the four tuple linguistic objects presented in the first video lecture and in the paper, this is about learning the relationships between utterances U, syntactic structures T, and semantic representations R. The denotation D is presumed to take care of itself in that we just execute R in order to get D. Here's a concrete instance of the semantic parsing task. For training data, we're given utterances or syntactic structures paired with logical forms. The task is to develop a model that, when given a new input in this class, will accurately pair it with a logical form. Now, as we discussed in the previous lecture, we don't want to try to do this starting from nothing. Rather, we start with a crude or permissive grammar, like the one on the right here. Uh, in this grammar, the rules of combination are presumed to be fixed and known by the system. We just code them up by hand. The crudeness of this grammar is in its treatment of the lexicon. For each one of these lexical items, for numbers and relations, we assume that they might be interpreted as any of the elements in their semantic class. For instance, the noun one in the syntax could be interpreted as any integer. And the predicate plus in the syntax could be interpreted as any one of the binary relations. This grammar takes us longer to write down in full like this, but it's actually a simplification if one thinks about the complexity of the underlying description of the grammar or the effort it would take to implement it. One way to look at the machine learning aspect of this problem is that we aim to ease the burden of writing perfect comprehensive grammars like the one we focused on in the last lecture, relying instead on our data and machine learning algorithms to build good grammars for us. This crude grammar can be thought of as a huge hypothesis space, and learning is the process of learning which hypotheses to trust and which to diminish. A bonus side effect of taking this learning approach is that we can also learn preferences for how ambiguities are resolved. For instance, with the right training data, we could learn typical bracketing conventions for ambiguous mathematical expressions. Let's now build up a full learning framework for semantic parsing. It's all going to fit in one slide. I'll present it all at once and then we can walk through a concrete example using it. So here we go. First, we define feature representations. These are concretely just vectors of real numbers of some fixed dimension d. We have lots of freedom for how these representations are obtained from the underlying data. For instance, we could say something like dimension i is a 1 if the input x contains the word minus. Or we could say dimension j counts the number of unary predicates in the input structure. We can even say that one of the dimensions in the feature vector returns the number of times a given input word is paired with a given symbol in the output y. Since the feature function phi is defined in terms of both the input x and the output y, both of which might be complex structured objects. Next we have a simple scoring mechanism. It takes the inner product of the feature representation and a weight vector w. This weight vector is our target for learning. Now we define a concrete training objective. It says that we want to find a weighting vector w that minimizes this summation with respect to our training data. The intuitive idea behind this summation is that for each training instance pair x, y, we look at all of the logical forms y prime compatible with x under our current grammar for each y prime, we compare the score we get from the actual logical form y with the score we get for this y prime, plus a fixed cost, usually 1, if y and y prime are different. 
So where y and y prime are the same, the value of this term is zero. Where y and y prime are different, we pay a cost to the extent that the weighting vector assigns a high score to the pairing of x with y prime. The final piece is an optimization algorithm. Here we use stochastic gradient descent. Its inputs are a set of training pairs D, which contains sentences paired with their logical forms, as well as a number of training iterations T, and a learning rate eta, which could be set at some small value like 0.1 or computed based on T. The algorithm starts with an all-zero weight vector and then does t many iterations through the data d, shuffling d at each pass. The action is in lines 4 and 5, which iteratively compute the subgradient of a single term of the optimization problem given above. Again, we see the same dynamic. In line 4, we use the current grammar and weights to pick a logical form output. If it's the same as the actual output in our training data, then this subtraction here is zero and nothing changes. However, if the predicted output is different from the actual one, then we make an adjustment to the weight vector. And at the end of training, we should have a weight vector that, together with our grammar, produces accurate predictions about logical forms, we hope. This example shows the learning framework in action on a simple example generated by our grammar. The input is 2 times 2 plus 3. Assume that our grammar produces just three parses for it to keep things simple. The first and third are intuitively fine in that they give the expected interpretations to all of the items. The middle one is intuitively suboptimal though. It treats the input word times as though it had the semantics of addition. For this example, we can't detect this in the output denotation because 2 times 2 and 2 plus 2 are equal, but the logical forms are different in a way that we would like to detect. And we assume just for this example that the correct logical form is y1. That is, we assume that it's the form that we saw in the training data. The featureization of these trees turns them into weight vectors phi, here we just show the values that are non-zero. For example, a feature like this one fires if the logical form symbol for multiplication is paired with the word times. So we have a bunch of lexical features like this. We also have features that detect what the main connective is, the topmost functional symbol. So here we say top is plus. Here we say top is plus. And here we say top is multiplication. Next, we have some iterations of stochastic gradient descent on these feature vectors. At iteration 1, y2 and 3 incur equal penalties just because of the cost incurred by being different from the training target. Here we assume that y3 was chosen arbitrarily of the two. This causes a separation in the new weight vector for the features that distinguish y1 and y3. Now we do a second iteration, and here y2 is chosen. This in turn adjusts the weights in favor of the intuitively correct lexicon, where the word times is associated with multiplication rather than addition. And we achieve the training objective in that the weights now favor y1 as the predicted output for our input. In the simple grammar we've been working with, there is not any derivational ambiguity in that we assume that the inputs are syntactic structures and each one of them has exactly one logical form and final denotation. In the rich grammars like those developed by Luke Zettelmoyer and colleagues, the inputs are utterances, just strings, and they can be associated with multiple logical forms that all have the same logical expression on their root node and therefore the same denotation. It's easy to add this possibility of derivational ambiguity to our current grammar with two rules that together implement the logical operation that is often called lift. The intuition behind lift goes like this. Usually, if we have an integer, it will be the argument to a unary predicate like minus. What lift does is reverse the order of this operation, turning the integer into the functor.
it now takes the unary functor as its argument. After all the computations are done, this reduces down to the original expression that we would have gotten without lift. The two trees on the right illustrate this possibility. The logical forms are different, but they end up computing the same thing. Now I confess that there is no compelling reason to introduce this kind of ambiguity into this grammar, except to highlight what it does to the learning framework. The derivational uncertainty we just introduced has an important effect on the learning problem. Here's how we pose it now. The training data consists of pairs consisting of an utterance and the final logical form, uh, the expression decorating the root node of the full logical form structure that our grammar produces. There are now potentially many paths to the same logical form expression, as we saw in the previous example involving lift. Thus we change the objective to a latent variable objective. I think the best way to get an intuition for how the problem has changed is to look at the new version of stochastic gradient descent given at the bottom of the slide here. Our training instances are now utterances together with their final logical form expression. Thus in line 4, we use the grammar to produce the highest scoring logical form for the input that has R as its final denotation, as given by the current weight vector and the grammar. In line 5, we act as though things were just like they were in the original formulation. They aren't quite the same though in the sense that the Y we chose isn't there in the data, but rather a prediction of the current model. This makes the optimization problem much more difficult. In fact, it is no longer a convex optimization problem. The preceding brief interlude into derivational ambiguity and latent variable objectives sets the stage well for addressing the problem of trying to learn from denotations directly. In this problem, we really take on the entire grammar in the sense that we try to learn the full pairing of utterances u or syntactic structures t with their denotations d as mediated by the logical form representation r. The motivation for this formulation is pretty clear. Basically, we don't find logical form expressions like this one in nature, and it requires a lot of time and expertise to construct them, and we need to formulate a full theory of representations just for the sake of collecting data. In contrast, it is often quick and easy to provide denotations and they are in many ways representation independent. So our models will be more relevant and usable in more situations if we can learn directly from denotations. This slide begins to convey how much harder this problem is intuitively. Our training pairs are now utterances or syntactic structures paired only with their final denotations. The prediction task is then to map new utterances to their correct denotations directly. To do this, we again begin with a crude grammar of the sort we used in the basic semantic parsing formulation. The rules of combination are again fixed, and we consider a really large space of potential lexical hypotheses. We do, though, assume that each logical form as expression is interpreted deterministically. That is, we allow that there is uncertainty around what the word times picks out, but we do not allow uncertainty about what the logical form expression ends up denoting. The resulting learning framework can then be expressed in roughly the same terms as we used for the latent variable version of the semantic parsing model. Again, the feature representations are and the scoring functions can stay the same. The objective function and optimization framework need to change though. Let's again skip to the optimization algorithm. Our training data have denotations as outputs. We need a logical form to execute in order to get at those denotations. So in line 4, we use the grammar and our current weights to choose the best looking logical form that has the right denotation giving our, given our training instance. That's the restriction given here. Then we use it to make a standard comparison from our first formulation of SGD here in line 5, and we adjust the weights accordingly. So the logic is the same as in semantic parsing, it's just that we have to take the risky step of using what we currently learn to build a bridge to the final denotation in our training data. The indirectness of this process makes learning considerably harder. To get a better sense for how this new problem is harder, let's return to our running example. 
The inputs and its associated trees are the same as before, as are the feature representations. So as a reminder, our input is x, 2 times 2 plus 3. The correct denotation is y1, and these two are distractors. The training iterations in this new setup now look different. At step 1, we consider two logical forms, y1 and y2. That is, the two that have the same denotation as our target logical form y1. Logical form 3 then incurs the largest training cost as before. At iteration 2, the weight vector looks the same as it, as it did in the semantic parsing example, but we are now in an important sense stuck. y1 and y2 are indistinguishable in terms of their denotations, so we can't get any additional signal. In practice, implementations of these models will probably pick randomly between y1 and y2 at this stage, and so they will sometimes luck into the right example, but there is an important sense in which no more learning can happen for this example. Intuitively, we need more data to distinguish addition and multiplication because this particular example collapses them together. To close, though, I should add that interpretive models like this one do have an ace up their sleeve. They can define feature functions phi that are directly tied to how forms relate to denotations, and this can be quite powerful in terms of learning.